Welcome everybody to the first of our Tech Talk uh, series from uh, NGCDI and uh, thanks very much James for being first and uh, looking forward to it. Um, uh, so you can see uh, James introducing himself from Lancaster University there, Statistics, Math and Stats Department. Uh, and just to, a tiny bit of context, um, you know, if you've got a, a vast digital uh, infrastructure, then you need it to tell you what it's doing. And in particular, you want it to tell you if it's if something needs to happen, you need to intervene in some way. So amongst all the enormous sea of statistics, of the kind of vast amount of data that's flying around, how do you pick out the bad apples? And uh, that's the subject of James' talk. So, and uh, James is happy. If there's anything urgent question as we go, it's happy to be interrupt, interrupted, uh, but there will be time for questions at the end as well. So thanks very much, James. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Cheers. And thank you for yeah for the opportunity to give this talk. I'm quite excited to do, to do so. So yeah, um, unsurprisingly, um, and given Steve's introduction, the the kind of the setting for what I'm going to talk about today um, is the problem of kind of controlling and monitoring a telecoms network. Um, and given the audience today, I probably don't need to work as hard as I might otherwise do to introduce why that's interesting and important. But um, when I began working as a postdoc in NGCDI, I'm now a smaller academic role, but um, when I began that project, we were interested in looking at the problem of monitoring um, various streams of data within, say, BT's core wired network. Um, this looks like multivariate time series that have kind of some dependence structure, um, some, some change in relationship um, from hour to hour and similar behavior across nodes. And we know that kind of engineers and experts within BT currently, you know, they monitor these series via a range of tools looking for maybe outages or faults where there's some issue with the, the flow or the data collection, et cetera. And they'll do, they'll do various things in light of that. They might reroute traffic on the network. They might schedule some kind of maintenance. They might keep an eye on certain things um, in light of what they're seeing from the data. And the kind of very high level question here, the kind of initial research question was, can some form of machine learning replicate this behavior? Can we learn to train an algorithm, a computer to do some of this job of monitoring and taking decisions on the network? And I think the, the first kind of conclusion we quite quickly came to is that automating that role is, is really hard. It's not, it's not feasible, it's not sensible or possible. Um, there's too much complexity in the role of, you know, this, this kind of expert task. Um, not only do, does, do the experts that perform this monitoring and, and decision making need to combine knowledge, not only from the time series, from different parts and different days of the time series, they need to combine it with sort of soft knowledge about the structure of the network, other things that might be going on in particular contexts and knowledge of the, the company and the infrastructure as a whole. Um, clearly needs a lot of domain expertise that maybe isn't something that can be quantified mathematically. Beyond that, the actions that are taken themselves, so these ideas of, of rerouting and um, scheduling maintenance are, are complex things. They're not just zero one on off decisions that, that are easily boiled down into a simple kind of optimization task. These are, you know, difficult balancings of resource management, human resource management, deciding what time to take particular actions and when to wait and see what happens. Um, and kind of fourthly, a, another issue is that because we're dealing in anomalous events and we're dealing and responding to kind of strange or unusual patterns in the data. That means that we're often looking at things that are really rare, things that we maybe haven't seen before at all, um, and generally things that will have a small set of data pertaining to, which can be really challenging for, um, for some of the more sophisticated, more complex algorithms out there. Um, and the kind of things that can handle really complicated action sets. There's also this idea that there might be changes in what normal behavior looks like as the network develops and people's usage does. So there's a lot there that really the kind of punchline there is a complete replacement of, of this thinking with autonomous decision making is, 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 is wholly unrealistic. It's, it's not, not something, especially in this anomaly centered area, to try and be doing. 
But we did realize, you know, that there are aspects that are more amenable to support from algorithmic decision making. So we instead didn't try to think about making decisions, so deciding how to reroute or how to main, how to perform maintenance or how to do tasks like this in response to these rare events, um, but flagging when um, statistically interesting sort of artifacts in a time series necessitate a decision to be made by a human expert. So we imagined working in, in the following kind of pipeline where we continuously and initially monitor the data um, and using some kind of statistical algorithm, the kind of things that you might have seen my colleagues um, and statistics speak about in terms of anomaly detection and change point detection to find kind of interesting regions in the data. So like those that I circled in the graph a few slides ago. And what we'll then do when such a, a region is highlighted, when an artifact in the data is presented as being potentially interesting, an algorithm will weigh up whether that is important enough to essentially to, to bother a human with, whether that's something that looks like it needs to have some kind of decision made, to have a judgment call made as to whether that should be investigated further, whether something should be done about it, or whether the algorithm can decide, right, no, we don't, we can ignore that for now. I've seen stuff similar to that before that was innocuous, and so I've got a high confidence that this is innocuous. And this would be a very iterative kind of a procedure. Um, as we get information from the human or as we make decisions, this would feed back into our monitoring phase, feed back into the kind of the pinpointing of interesting regions and the, the trade-off between what should be shown to the human in the future. So this kind of high level um, framework has got two main parts to it and the two, the two parts really need to work in tandem, but I'm going to focus on one aspect today. So the first part is the anomaly detection, which, um, as I've said, colleagues of mine at Lancaster, so Idris, Ed, um, Lawrence, you might have seen speak at an NGCDI event before, are you know very well versed in this, as are some other folks in NGCDI, and have sophisticated methods to pick out statistically uh, novel artifacts within a data set. Um, and then the second part of this approach is to then classify those statistically interesting things as are they just noise? Are they something actually going wrong in the network? Are we something that we, we can't really classify ourselves? So we need to ask an expert. When I'm saying we here, I'm really talking about the algorithm or myself and my colleagues as the, the programmers of this algorithm. Um, so it's this second part that I'm going to focus on today, and I'm going to focus on the unique challenge that comes from um, this interaction with the human expert and this kind of one-sided information problem. So we're posing this decision to flag this uh, particular anomaly or a particular artifact in the data to the human or not as a really simple binary classification task. Um, so every time a potentially interesting anomaly arises in the data, we're going to say that it has some kind of associated summary, um, a set of, of numbers that describe it basically. So these could be properties coming out of the anomaly detection algorithm, such as you know, how big of a deviation is it from the norm? How long does that deviation last? And it can also be kind of extraneous information, such as what's going on in the other channels of the time series, or what time of day is it? Are there any other events going on in the network or planned maintenance that we know about or something like that? So this can really depend on the more granular um, kind of setting that we're in. It can really be tailored to the problem that we're thinking about. And the second aspect that we assume is kind of attributed to each of these anomalies that arise is a, a true class that is unobserved that we don't know yet as the, as the decision-making algorithm. Um, and that kind of encodes whether it's something that's of interest to the human or whether it's not. Um, and by interesting, I mean either it's a genuine fault that they definitely need to take action upon, or it's something that is kind of unseen or unknown or just having encountered that piece of information will be beneficial to the to the expert, you know, it kind of help them build their own knowledge base and their own suite of examples of historical behavior on the network. So to aim to be able to do kind of algorithmic decision making here or to, to, to learn a model that's useful to support the expert here, we do need to kind of assume that to some extent 
these features have an association with this class. So if the, the information that we can collect about uh, an interesting region of the time series can somehow predict whether it's interesting or not um, to the decision to the human, then we can then we can make some progress. And in the sort of theoretical work that I've done on this problem that I'm not going to bore you with the details of today, but that underpin the approach and guarantee its um, its effectiveness in theory, at least, we would kind of assume maybe that there's a logistic regression type relationship between these features and the true class. So meaning that there are some unknown regression parameters that will quantify how much of an effect a particular aspect of the anomaly, so its size, its duration, other things going on in the network, affect the probability of it being interesting to the human or not. So binary classification, the logistic regression is super well studied. We're not reinventing any wheels so far. Um, there are kind of various versions of it that I'll build up to the, the more complex setting that we have at hand in this problem. So offline binary classification is probably the, the, the simplest kind of version where we have collected a data set um, which consists of features associated with a history of different anomalies on the network and a history of classes. So whether they were something that the human did want to see or whether they weren't. And in this offline setting, we would train a model on that. Um, I won't go into the details. If you know them, you do. And if you don't, there shouldn't be an impediment to understanding the rest of the talk. But this would produce an estimate of the model, essentially. Um, and that would allow any time that we get a future set of features. So another anomaly presents itself with a different set of um, attributes. We would just use this model that we already have to predict whether it's interesting or not and from there decide whether to show it to the human or not. The next kind of more sophisticated version of this is to do that in an online iterative procedure. So we might start with little or no historic data. This, this data set X1 to Xn might contain no data at all or it might just have a few um, that we'd use to kind of initialize a model. But the idea is that the, the more accurate model that we're going to use for classification is built up sequentially. So we iteratively would observe um, data X, T, predict the class of, of that anomaly, and then observe whether we were right or not, with a view to making as accurate predictions as we can, because making an inaccurate prediction would suffer some kind of cost. So if we if we didn't flag an anomaly that was genuinely um, worrisome as interesting, then something might go wrong on the network because we didn't take we didn't have the opportunity to take action. The third and final variant that I'm going to speak about in the rest of the talk is very similar to this online setting, but with partial feedback. Um, and this is going to capture kind of the key difficulty in this framework that we've looked at so far in this semi-autonomous algorithm. So this is exactly the same in that we iteratively observe a context and predict whether it's um, interesting or not, i.e. decide to show it to the human or not. But we're only going to then find out whether that prediction was right if we've shown it to the human. So this is to say that if we, you know, if we decide that a particular anomaly isn't interesting, don't raise an alarm, don't get an engineer involved, that may well be the right thing to do if that indeed is not a, you know, not a real anomaly. Um, but we'll never actually find that out for sure, or we might not find it out for a very long time, because we won't observe that true label provided by the human. And that actually makes that that aspect makes this task a lot more challenging because we need to kind of consider that in our data collection process. We need to take actions and make recommendations that will bring the human into the loop to give us some information. So I'm going to take a little bit of a sidestep now to kind of give a second example of this to hang your thinking on um, of a similar dilemma arising in kind of a, a toy setting, but that quite nicely mirrors this. Um, so this is this so-called apple tasting problem, which was kind of a, a hypothetical toy problem proposed about 30 years ago. Um, and I want you to imagine if such a thing exists, that you work on the kind of production line in an apple packaging plant. If, I, okay, if, I'm not sure if that's a job that actually still exists, but imagine you're doing quality control here. And your job is apples will go past you and you want to let all the good apples through so that they can be packaged up, sent to the supermarket and sold to people and remove any bad apples. 
Um, but all you're really allowed to do initially is look at those apples and say, oh, that one looks good, that looks good, that looks good, that one maybe doesn't look so good. Um, and so what you want to do is be able to improve your ability to classify apples based on looking at them. But for us, the only true way to, to figure out what is a good apple and what is a bad apple um, is by tasting it, which will destroy it and mean that it can't be sold. And this is desirable for bad apples. We want to take them off the line. We want to check, oh, yeah, that's definitely a bad apple. Cool, that's another data point. We can update our model. But it's wasteful for good apples because we could have sold those for a profit. And the analog here to the, the fault detection problem is that it's desirable to, um, to show genuine anomalies to the, to the human expert. Um, and we'll get a label if we do that, but it's wasteful to show things that are innocuous to the human because it's going to waste their time looking at something that isn't, doesn't necessitate action. So the challenge here in either version of these problems, whether you want to think about it in terms of apples or in terms of, of faults, is that to maximise accuracy, some of the things that don't truly need to be tested because they're, they're fine, they don't need to be tasted apples, they don't need to be shown to the human, we have to do that test anyway for the sake of collecting data. Otherwise, we won't train an accurate model because we won't know what good looks like and what bad looks like. But it's non-trivial to dis kind of say which ones we should do that with and how many of them. So we repeatedly face this following, the following question. Given that an apple or an anomaly presents some features XT, and we have some best guess of whether it is a good apple or a bad apple or a true anomaly or a, an innocuous artifact in the data, how do we choose whether to, to show it to the, the human expert or to taste it? Um, I've put this note here that you could make that decision making at, OK, if you if you think it's greater than a 50 percent chance, then it's bad. And if you don't, it's not. You could be more conservative than that. Um, but for part of for ease, let's assume that if it's if it looks like more than 50, then then we'll call it bad. Um, so you might say, well, why don't we just have a little bit of data at the start, try a few apples, have a have an initial model, get some initial data and just then from there on, use our best guess all the time. If it looks bad, show it to the human. If it looks good, don't do the, like don't show it to the human and hope that you know there'll be a few a few misclassifications in there. So we'll continue to collect some data on what is actually good, even though we thought it was bad. And eventually it'll all come out in the wash and correct itself. Um that could happen. That could, if, if you get lucky, um, if you start with a good estimate and you the data arrives in the right sequence, that could be the case um, and it could work brilliantly. But that approach, unfortunately, has a like a non-zero probability of also failing catastrophically. So imagine you initialize this with a model that maybe gets 50% of the bad instances accurately classified, but and 50% of the bad instances are considered to be good as are all of the good instances. And you persist with that model um, and make all your classifications based on that. What would happen then is that you would only collect data which confirms your bias. You would take all of these good apples and some of the bad ones and not get any labels for them because you'd say, oh no, they're good to go to, this, go to the market. And it might be a long time before you find out that they were actually bad. And the only ones that you'll collect data on are bad apples that you're really sure are bad. Um, and then that will just confirm that bias. You'll never see anything to tell you you're wrong, but you'll be running at a loss persistently. So how do we how do we get this right? How do we avoid having that possibility of going wildly wrong? Well, what we need to do is ensure that we balance between exploring and collecting data to get a good estimate of the model and exploiting the information. So not just tasting everything and saying, like, look at my lovely big data set, but all these apples that I've never put out to market because I've tasted them all. Um, so there are two main ways that people do this and that they achieve this balance. Um, and one of these is, is by being conservative, by using so-called confidence bands. So in that setting, you'll only treat um, an apple as being a good one if we're very certain that it's good or very certain relative to, to kind of the uncertainty in our model. So what this effectively does is, is rather than um, classify everything at our sort of best belief, we're a bit more conservative. We say we have to be pretty sure that it's a good apple for us not to take 
let's just show it to the human in case and let's just make sure. Um, as we do that, we'll collect more and more data. Um, so we'll be able to be more and more confident and even being kind of conservative at the 90% level or whatever will start to look more like our best guess. So we'll converge eventually to the method we spoke about before, but with a stronger model. A second technique um, is to do some randomization to, to add this sampling. So rather than be conservative about everything, we look at how how certain we are about a particular a particular anomaly or a particular apple being a good or a bad instance and add a little bit of noise to that prediction, which is proportional to how much uncertainty we have in that. So what that will do is that will sometimes take something that we think, oh, I think it's probably good, but I'm not sure. And that little bit of noise will just be enough to push it over into being classified as bad. And that will encourage us to get a little bit more data, but it'd be less likely to do that if we're very sure that it's good. So it won't waste time tasting apples that are clearly brilliant and should go to market or, anomalies that are clearly not an issue, um, getting the human to come along for those. So both of these techniques, because they are conservative or noisy in proportion to the, the uncertainty, will eventually converge to doing um, what the best prediction says, but they will only do that once we've got enough data. Um, I'm a little conscious of time, so I'm going to skip over this more technical slide, but I'm very happy to speak in more detail about um, one of these methods for randomization offline. Um, but what this approach has done basically, um, at the state at quite a high level, but what we've done is we've put anomaly detection and online classification together. And the idea is that this produces a semi-autonomous algorithm that learns to kind of take some of the, the load off the human decision maker by learning what it's interested in and what they're learning what they're interested in and what they're not interested in, but doing it in a quite a safe way. So doing it in a way that waits until it's got enough data, is adaptive to the data that it's observed, and you know makes smart decisions about which things to ask for more information on and which not to. It's deliberately a modular approach at the moment. You know, you can put any anomaly detection you like in here, really, and it will summer, you know, depending on what type of data you're looking at, because the, the decision making part is really just operating on these features. And you can put different types of models in here. It doesn't have to be a logistic regression model. So yeah, this has kind of summarized what I've just said, but it's allowing us to automate where possible without having a lot of data up front, and it continues to learn as it proceeds. Going forward, um, we'd like to get our hands messy with a little bit more of a real application of this. So we're trying to look for settings where this model feels, feels useful and suitable, and we want to explore kind of more complex variants of it as well. So maybe there'll be settings where it's not just ignore it or show it to a single expert, you might have a choice between different experts or different experts with different levels of seniority and maybe different information quality coming from those. Or you might have a choice between different kind of procedures that you could follow if you don't ignore the anomaly. You might sort of bank it in the data and keep an eye on it for an hour or so. You might follow a particular protocol or you might say, I really don't know, I want to get the expert involved. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about that. As, I, as Steve said, I'm happy to take questions about this just now or, or offline. Um, and yeah, thank you.